Welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged. I'm Morgan with Arna, and today we're talking to Alan Moore. Alan is an author, an artist, a musician, a dancer, a storyteller, and his passion lies in discussing beauty. Yeah, and, and it's so fascinating that also the way, you know, you just said it, you know, discussing beauty, your your mind goes to, oh, beauty, that's nice, that's cute, that's beautiful, that's, you know, that's, that's such a, it's, that's not it. It's way <laughs> more. Much more. Much more, it's deeper and profound, and if you think about it, regenerative is, is yes. what it comes down to. When something's beautiful, it's regenerative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that was, so I, that's something I'm going to take away from the conversation like when it's not beautiful it's not regenerative and so how can you make it more beautiful yeah and that it's life-giving beauty is life-giving yeah as well and there's and of course alan explains it much more gracefully than either of us can yeah but there were a lot of <laughs> but yeah, sorry biggest... i had to laugh because i really like <laughs> yeah yeah because some people can just they speak. They can talk. They, mm-hmm. like, they, can, they have language that I don't possess, and 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 you know, and and yeah, stories and, and I don't know, sentences. You know that kind of <laughs> yeah, stuff. terminology, terminology, the, and the ideas behind it, right? Like he, he explained beauty as a layer cake, where aesthetics is only a very small piece or a small layer of that, and and of course, you know, there can be a a beautiful person, which could describe their soul, right? Not just their appearances, but it could describe, oh, that person, they're so beautiful, like inside, you know? But he he dives into what it really means and also why why it's important to do beautiful business and... Making the world a better place. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, you know, this podcast obviously is searching for you know, creative leadership. The, what does it mean? Mm-hmm. What are those? What are those people? Um, what do they do? Um, and and in that sense, he is one of those examples. Not someone. So you can't copy. You can't be Alan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, that position's yeah, filled. Yes, it's filled. <laughs> but you can't. You no, know, but it, because it's it, he's a unique person with a mm-hmm. unique story, like we all are, everyone. So. And he's one of those people that are clearly unique, but gives you the, you know, the permission because he mm-hmm. shows you another option, another way of thinking, another way of speaking. And, and just by saying, I want to make the world a better place, giving you the permission to also want to do that instead of feeling like, who am I? You know, because it can sound somewhat arrogant. But if we don't, I mean, because that's basically how you design the future by consciously mm-hmm. recognizing that that's what we do even if you, you if you think you're not doing it you're doing it anyway so rather by than just letting you know things go and just taking it for granted yeah um, you know, recognize the fact that you know we are designing the future anyway so better do a good job and and so i don't know i like that yeah um, yeah and it and sometimes it's very overwhelming to think okay how am I going to design the future right and especially he talks about how we're kind of living in a bit of a dystopian age Mm. you know things feel very overwhelming lots of wars lots of floods (laughs) but but you can also think maybe more locally how can I design my future yeah it starts with you it starts starts with with one person am I the kind of person that makes my bed every day I don't know. Do I want to be that person? Yes, I am this person. But it's these little things, you know? Are you? That's Are you I person? I am this person who makes my bed every day. Yes. Really? Yes. Why? Because you're going to make a mess of it anyway. But right? it's so nice to walk into my room and it's just made for <laughs> and it's waiting to yeah. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah. In the in my I don't have so much storage space in my apartment. So in the other rooms, I'm, you know, I have boxes and bookshelves and, and, you know, tools and golf clubs, but then in my bedroom, it's just, (laughs) it's just my bed. (laughs) And, and that's very calming. So I'm like, okay, I can also make my bed and. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. (laughs) (laughs) 
fun I'm facts sure nobody asked for. That... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm just thinking, how does that make the world a better place? But, but no, no, but it does because you know, you know, it starts with you. It starts with, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there's only, you know, there's only really one kind of change. It's personal change because mm -hmm. that's how you change the things you do by you changing and that means yeah other people can change because you're doing it etc cetera, etc cetera. it's not you don't change the world by changing other people because you can't it's sadly can not i've no. tried <laughs> yeah yeah exactly no but but it's you can only change yourself mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you can give give people options and can be an example mm -hmm. and then people are like oh that's possible too you know and then and then and that's how you could say you change other people but actually they change themselves like you can change yourself Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's all you know that's both i think the only way and also the hardest way because it's so much easier to point fingers at other people going they should change they should do something different and it's not it's you should change uh, yeah and be an example and that that will change other people probably but it's by allowing them and giving them options and giving them permission and giving them examples mm -hmm. that's the way so you know, I'm not saying I'm going to make my bed every night now. It might be something different you for you. Give me, give me, <laughs> you did give me sort of an, an option where you're like, oh, I, I, okay, that's possible. <laughs> that is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Enjoy this episode. I hope you guys take away yeah, a new way of thinking about beauty and a bit of a perspective shift, which Alan also shares. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Enjoy. I, a person that has always been obsessed by how we can make the world a better place. In my past, someone that would have loved to have spent a lot of time on the dance floor. Not so much these days, but as a younger man, definitely dance and music. I was a musician. I worked as an artist. And I still think that creativity is something which we all possess in a whole variety of different ways where we can contribute in very small ways and very big ways to making the world a better place than the one that we currently have. So that's off the cuff a little bit about how I feel about the world. So when did you start? So it, it, it does resonate, but I'm, I'm curious, when was the moment that you really said to yourself, I, don't want, I want to make the world a better place? Where, where does that, because as a kid, I mean, maybe, maybe, but you probably don't have that kind of understanding of the world as a whole, like this is going to be something I'm going to improve upon. But when does that happen where you go like, yeah, that's what I really want. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it is a good question. I think that I don't think there's a single moment, but I think there's a process of osmosis. Mm -hmm. So I think that growing up in the house that I did, my you know my parents always cooked from scratch. So we sat down to a, a you know a family meal every every day. There was a lot of music in our house. There were a lot of people coming and going. There were parties that we had, and I couldn't kind of really you know I wasn't as a kid kind of look, marking that down as this is a better place. But in a sense, my parents were making the world a better place just literally by the cultural practice of being who they were and we had a lot of fun on not a lot of money i would i would say i think music when i was growing up so i'm 60 so in the 80s music had a very particular cultural and political charge to it which is a bit different to the world that we're in today and i'm not saying that musicians today aren't commenting on those things or whatever mm. Yeah. But it, it was something that you felt an energy to. So there was a lot of commentary about the world that we were living in politically. And I think that I was always, I seemed to be politically aware and sensitive to 
what was happening in our in our world, not just in the UK, but a little bit further afield as well. And I used to sort of dwell on those things. And actually, I would ask the question of why would you choose to go and do some very bad things to people, rockets, missiles, you know, whatever, because that's very destructive. I had a friend of my father's, and I could have only been a 10-year-old boy, who had gone to Poland, and he had been taken to Auschwitz, and he came back. And I remember my father saying, we, we're going to go around and see Johnny. His name was Johnny Johnson, actually. And his son was called Johnny Johnson. But <laughs> there you go. But I, I sat there incredulous when he explained the experience that he had had. And, uh, you know, as a, I was, you know, the, as a 10-year-old boy, you know, I was aware of the Second World War. I was aware of the Battle of Britain. I was aware of, you know, certain things about that narrative. You know, so I was born in 1964. So, you know, my parents were part of that generation that experienced the war. But I found it an incredibly profound moment as a 10-year-old boy listening to this man who shared with me a document that explained what human beings were capable of doing to other human beings at a scale that I just couldn't imagine. And I ended up actually doing a school project about the persecution of the Jews. And I remember lying in bed one night reading this so uh, at this point i would have i would have been about 14 and it, it goes into this very sort of detailed explanation of, of of what happened to jewish people in the program whether they went to auschwitz or belsen or other places and i tried to imagine could i imagine you know a single person that was lying dead on the floor in our bedroom, I could. Could I imagine two? I could. Could I imagine 10? I could. And then you're trying to get into the scale of thousands mm. and you just cannot imagine the scale of what human beings can do to other human beings at that level of destruction. And I don't know, it's always stuck with me. Then the work that needs to be done is the work that needs is about healing and helping to change the world for a better place rather than actually being one where we can be so catastrophically destructive. Isn't it easier to become sort of, I don't know, cynical and go like, you know, it, it's unimaginable. How can I possibly yeah. change this? So in a way you, you have, from that actually became actually quite courageous in that sense say no i'm going to i'm going to make the world a better place which is in a way because it's such a huge task and, and the way you describe it as well i actually go oh where do you start because people mm -hmm. are awful well yeah people are awful but then also also people are absolutely magnificent and extraordinary and you know we on a daily basis, demonstrate the capacity of superhuman goodness, forgiveness, generosity, love, compassion, empathy, and at the other end of the spectrum, people have the capacity to do the most awful things that you could ever possibly imagine. And I suppose that I was I was compelled by the idea that creative acts, whatever they were, because creativity generally is about making the world a better place rather than one which is not so great. I don't know. We might want to debate that. Other people <laughs> might think that's... Uh, I think well, worldviews may differ on what is a better place, but I think, yeah, to... The, well, the well, the, the the principle, the you know, the universal idea that one could live cheek by jowl with your fellow man in harmony, in respect, 
we may not share all the same worldviews, but we can we can do that. And it's really, it's really funny because I was thinking very deeply about what life was like, let's say a thousand years ago, maybe even longer, when we were learning to navigate the world in ships and boats and trading and you know whatever. And there was a great deal of sharing, an extraordinary amount of sharing. And so when we look at the political debates we've got at the moment, where we talk about borders and sovereignty and ownership, migration, immigration, whatever, which obviously has become a very hot topic and potato in many countries around the world. I don't think there's one that's not touched by those things. The reality is, is that if one is prepared to look back in time, what you see is, is that when knowledge is shared, you know, in a in a generous way. In fact, there's a book that's just come out called The Gold, The Gold Roads, I think. And it was all about actually how India was played such an important role in sharing its spices and its fabrics and you know its artifacts and its knowledge to the rest of the world you know were we were we not to be more porous as as a species then that knowledge potentially could have been lost because we would have closed our borders as a, as a consequence of that mm. and i find it interesting that finally the idea that indigenous knowledge and wisdom might not be such a bad thing is a really good thing to be embraced but it's taken a long time for that to to come around so i hope there's going to be a bit more of that yeah and especially the stories that aren't preserved with documents or photographs or text right the oral traditions and the knowledge and stuff that's really fascinating yeah yeah well, the number zero came from India, albeit we talk about the idea that, you know, it was the Chinese or the Arabian, we call it the the, the Arabian numerical system. But in fact, I was just listening to a Radio 4 program this morning. And so zero is a number. It's not zero. But it completely changes the way that you can imagine the world and mm-hmm. the way that you can kind of computate it by the fact of that very simple, you know, that digit, you know, that was India. And of course, there are many other things. I mean, I think about, there's a great book called The Dawn of Everything. I was just by going guy. to mention this. It's so funny. Yeah. I actually looked up the title because I read it in, in Dutch. And I was just going to mention it because you made me think of this story. Sorry, I, I have to cut because that was mind blowing for me. Because it, at the beginning yeah. of the book, it talks about how First Nation, people from the U S mm-hmm. how, and it's you, you probably can explain it better than I, but how actually they influenced sort of because their way of life and the way they saw society and the way they saw sort of the way they, you know, life in general, but also how to, how to arrange, you know, the, the way they lived to, and, and their culture that influenced the people going there, the colonizers, and they, came back to Europe and they influenced the French Revolution because of, mm. uh, you know, First Nation people in the U.S. So to me, it was like, what? Because we started, as Europeans started colonizing that Northern America, we we encountered people with a completely different way of looking at, at life and, and society and culture that influenced those Europeans. They came back and that, in, again, influenced the... Uh, the, uh, the sorry, the French Revolution, and I, and uh, although this is a podcast, but I just got a message that my camera is stuck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Alan, was that that was what you was that the thing you were, wanted to mention, or uh, is there something else? In um, yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, I think it's a very interesting. I mean, reading that book, a profound revelation. I think that one one can view the world in in a very different type of way Mm. and so they they talked about the they talked about the there were no laws there was no poverty 
there were no fences mm. the idea that you were protectors or stewards of the land yeah to me i thought was was very interesting and relevant to the world that we live in today and that to me is where i thought that the the conversation with vingro was very important and so they they built a very different type of society one that europeans wanted to describe as the noble savage but one which actually was in fact i think that these people you know if you if you've hung around the planet for say 80,000 years as a you know as a, as a cultural group I think you've kind of worked a few things out at a fundamental level. And I think our arrogance, which is primarily based on the concept of ownership and control, power, the mm -hmm. and it's not to say that these things weren't part of, you know, these different, you know, cultural uh, indigenous institutions around the world, whether that's through South America north america whatever but there was this incredible sense of respect for the land the idea of legacy as being something that was very important how you kind of really worked in a practice of regeneration and that is something which is very important to the work that i do and i'm very interested in so i think sustainability is a kind of bit of a cul-de-sac in terms of the ideas and the practices that you know we could or should be you know using but this idea of re-embracing the the idea of regeneration mm. as a philosophy as yeah. a practice not just with the land but also with the kind of societies that we want to create or the economies that we should be creating to me is very important and one that i'm you know, I'm I'm very kind of curious about and thinking about quite often. Yeah, yeah. And there's, yeah. A, I th I can see that there's also a shift because, of course, sustainability is a is an important topic, right? But I can see that there's a, also a rise with the regenerative being applied to much more than just physical resources, and that's a that's very exciting to think about yeah. how you might apply it. Yeah. So I've got a I've got a shorthand which is. So you would know that, you know, my work is, my interest is around beauty, mm -hmm. beauty and design. But with beauty, I say that nature's run the longest R&D project we've ever known. And she's created the conditions for all life to thrive yeah. without wasting a single atom over a very, very long period of time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, actually, you know, all of the, the physical laws that describe how nature works are said to be beautiful. In fact, Einstein was described as the poetic scientist, I think, actually, or theorist. <laughs> and so there's this idea that when a when a physical description or is is described, the more it's simplified, the more beautiful it becomes, the more true it is to actually how it describes how something is actually happening. Did you, uh, did you watch the film, The Beautiful Equations? I think I must have done. I, I think I, think, I, think I must have done. Yeah, I think I must have done. So it's actually, if I can correct, uh, Matt, Matt Collins, because I was reading up on your uh, work and the things you were doing. And so that really reminded me of this, this film. Uh, it's, it's, Matt Collins, he's an artist, I th think he's an artist, and they, he kind of dives into this world of maths and and he speaks to people like Stephen Hawkins. And I was watching this, and it, this is, again, one of those moments where I went, oh, I never thought about it, because they talk about how when a equation is beautiful, it's probably right. And to me, it was like, what are you saying? You are, <laughs> yeah. you're, you you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're not emotional people. You're a scientist. No. What are you talking no. about? How is beauty connected to that? So, so beauty is not about aesthetics. Aesthetics is, is to me, mm. a very small sliver of actually something much more fundamental mm. and, and much bigger, you know, and it's a layer cake. And 
it attaches itself to us in every single possible way that you could. What I was going to say was is that so the end kind of part of the story is is that nature's MO is around regeneration. Mm -hmm. And so if all the laws of the universe are described to be beautiful, then that means that beauty equals regeneration. Mm. And if if we want to hang around, as I said, for a bit longer, then actually then the playbook is actually about how do we become regenerative as opposed to how to become sustainable. Sustainability is, is an impossibility. Yeah. It's a very stressed position that we're that, that that we're we're in. And so I'm really, really interested in that concept of yeah. beauty being regenerative and all the things that we can learn from that in terms of how we go forward. And you know, I'll be dead a very long time before perhaps those concepts will really start to sort of play a key role, I, I think, in the world that we live in. Because we're still built on the concept of growth. We're still built on growth for growth's sake, numbers, greed, extraction, whatever. I think it's a battle royal, as we would say in English, in terms of the fight for the future of what a better world looks like. And I think that will run, it won't run over decades, it will run over hundreds of years where you will have certain people, you know, there's one that wants to be a president of the United States of America, there's one that sits in the Kremlin, he has a bit of a point of view on how things are going. There's a guy in, you know, Hungary, he has a bit of a point of view. We've got a whole bunch of folks here in the UK that also have a point of view in terms of how they would like to have power mm -hmm. over people. An indigenous perspective is, is that you use power in a very different type of way. And I'm not saying that we go back to being, you know, tribes in woods and, you know, and all the rest of it by any stretch of the imagination. But the conversation, and which I've learned it, the hard way is that the the means to really shift people's perceptions and ideas of what is possible or what is important or what should actually be in the narrative frame mm -hmm. so you know media is extremely good at it's like it's not what is just in the frame of conversation and using their power of distribution to do that, it's what is excluded out of the frame, which is not having a... So you would never mm -hmm. get, like, a front page of, you know, your daily newspaper, wherever you are, which is about revelation. It's recognised that Indigenous cultures, wisdoms and knowledge actually could be the future to our country's wealth, health and prosperity. It's just not going to get there, you know, yeah. There will be other people that will want to hold that frame. And, but, uh, but outside of that, I think as a species, as, as, as human beings, there is actually a very, very big conversation going on about who it is we would quite like to be. But it's going to take some time, I think, to get there. That's a huge topic. It's interesting to see sort of, or to hear your story from being this kid imagining sort of what it's like to see, you know, dead bodies basically in your room. And you kind of imagine the horror and the, and then I, I kind of like, you know, from basically, you know, looking at this and listening to this from, a, from afar, literally almost, that your you know, you, you, you came from a family that was, that was happy. It sounded very happy. It was a, right. And then you saw all the, the, the things that were wrong in the world or, or what the things that happened in the past. And, and in a way, your answer to this is I want to make the world a better place, but by taking a very positive attitude, talking about beauty, instead of saying, well, you know, you can, as a protest, you took the angle of, I'm going to, 
you know, you know, I, I, I think I read this somewhere. The beauty is the ultimate metric. You know, this is sort of. It's beauty. what we say. It's what we say. That's the the invitation and the provocation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, whereas that's a very positive approach to uh, trying to solve these terrible or, or huge big problems. And I, I'm not saying beauty is small. I think it's a very, it's a, but for a lot of people, I say like, that sounds very cute. That sounds yeah. like a very little, cute little thing you're doing. And uh, I, I think I, I know. Uh, give me, give me 20 minutes okay. with a person. <laughs> And I will take them from the idea that beauty is cute to actually beauty is something that is really profoundly mm -hmm. important and changing. And it's how you tell the story. And, and that to me is very important in terms of how you, and how you do that. Yeah. Um, you just did, by the way, I think you did actually, did, you already did that. And I think we, we are both totally convinced. I, but I do feel, and I haven't been, I haven't, been in that place but it's maybe a little bit similar towards what, what we were kind of coming up against as designers we because you know i come from, from a world of design where i felt that as a designer i wasn't really helping the world at all i was just you know getting briefs from clients mm -hmm. uh, to find this you know to make whatever product or whatever crap they're trying to sell make it a little more pretty or something and sell, sell more of it. And yeah. I, and, and when I was young, I was like, Oh, this is really cool. It's really nice. And after a while, I thought, wait a minute, what am I doing? Not, what am I doing? This, I'm, this is not the right place for me. I want to kind of, I want to solve real problems. I want to kind of have real meaning and real, you know, I want to understand how to have a positive impact on the, on the world. But as designers, we weren't taking serious, still not. Because, you know, design is, again, it's aesthetics. It's this, you know, you make things look pretty. And so we've been always trying to f sort of, it's not, I'm not saying it's a fight, but it's more, but it is a battle between sort of, no, no, wait, it's not about that. It's actually, we want to make, and I think it has something to do with beauty, not aesthetics, but with mm -hmm. beauty. Because beauty to me is also having, you know, real meaning creating things with real meaning for real people and if you go to that level all of a sudden you'll find at least in my mind that human beings in general and we're not talking about the you know the the, the, the people who want to get all the power but in general most human beings have the same needs we are not evil beings at all we actually have very simple very basic and actually maybe very beautiful needs and and that sort of for me, it has always been a, dr a driver going like, what, what you know, instead of looking at, you know, growth or, you know, this, this all these the things that you just mentioned, how can we be, you know, how can we be taken more serious as people who have a, a different solution or a different angle or a different option to what's out there? So I think, I, I, I think there's a whole world of, creative people or who are consciously creative or designers maybe artists or musicians basically i think we're missing those people by the way in music uh, that have that you know the commentary on the on the, the world as it is but i don't know that's sort of where i'm mm. trying to kind of create a language around it and i feel that in a way you have created a language around this whereas a lot of us and you can probably hear this in my Try to explain it. It's are struggling to get that story. So mm. you're saying I have a 20 minute story, you know, you know, and and you know, I'll convince anyone. I think I think we need that story. Well, thank you. And one of the things that you were when you were talking about how life is in nature is regenerative, it reminded me a lot of the principles of biomimicry. And I don't know if mm. I'm sure you're familiar with biomimicry, but they have a lot of different principles, but the main one is always life creates conditions conducive for life, hmm. which is essentially exactly what you said, right? Life is always going to do things. But what are, because Arna was saying like the language, you know, where we can see the, you and I, Arna and I can see the importance of beauty, but maybe a lot of people aren't yet there, but are there principles to beauty or like what you said, it's if it's a layer cake, aesthetics is just a small part. <laughs> What's else? What else is in the layer cake? 
Well, I think that the, so there's, I mean, the two books that I've written around this, so there's Do Design, Why Beauty is Key to Everything, and then Do Build, How to Make and Lead a Business the World Needs. And it's, you could say, well, so it's complicated, but we don't need to make it, or, or it's complex, but we don't need to make it complicated. And and the reality is we are very complex machines as human beings, albeit that the world that we inhabit or the world that speaks to us is almost like we aren't actually being met as this complicated machine that we that we are or this organism maybe is a better word in, in many respects. So I talk about the holy holy trinity of the hand, the heart, and the mind. And these things operate all at the same time. And when I was quite broken, which I'm very happy to talk about, but it was a part of how I ended up writing about beauty, I kind of realized that I'd ignored my soul for so long uh, you know, can we, bit, can we talk about this? I would love it, to hear this story. It was, it was a bit of a desert and, and I kind of realized that, you know, albeit, you know, I, I'd, I'd taken a garden, which was two acres when I was a very young man, which was completely derelict and over 30 years turned it into a very beautiful landscaped garden, a productive garden, which means then that we were growing vegetables at some scale as well as fruit and all the rest of it, as well as planting flowers and blah, blah, blah. But even in doing that, I hadn't really addressed the soulful part of who I was as a person. I think I'd been so focused about making things in the outside world that I wasn't really looking at what was going on in my interior space. You know, I came from a family which my dad was was atheist. I think my mum was agnostic. But I always actually had a kind of big spiritual need, and I don't know why that was. And there wasn't really kind of anything within my kind of orbit where you would be fed anything that was that felt spiritual other than music, actually. So music for me was my was my kind of soul food in a, in a way, you know, a track, a lyric, you know, whatever, somehow or other you were able to transcend from mm -hmm. where you were into a very different place, whatever, whatever that was. And so I realized that if I wasn't really in addressing what was going on inside me, then I was really ignoring the most important calling that I had and it was actually through that I ended up writing about beauty which as I describe as my homecoming or one's homecoming mm -hmm. our homecoming how do you come home and the idea that so the the story is is that I'm I'm really thinking about how do I come home and what is home to me and I end up at a memory which had never come to me before of being a seven-year-old boy on a, a family holiday on a beach in Cornwall. And my mum was always a very anxious woman. That was for many, many reasons. But when she got anxious, I got anxious. She could be quite controlling. And and yet where we we were on this beach... And she's in a knitted jumper, she's in a skirt, she's got, you know, bare legs, nothing on her feet, and she's really joyful. And it's wonderful to watch, and it's kind of weirding me out at the same time because that's, like, not how mum was. I thought about my father, who was wartime educated, so he left school at 14 during the Second World War, and he never earned a lot of money in his life but he always worked with his hands and he had an incredible emotional intelligence I reflected on. And I would say you could never put a Rizla paper 
between my mother and my father. So, you know, if you're going to roll a cigarette, that's the wrist of paper. So, you know, it's a very thin piece of paper. And I thought about my brother and my sister, who I loved unconditionally, and myself. And I thought I'm at one with those I love the most. I'm at one with myself, and I hadn't always been at one with myself. And then I thought, and I'm at one with the natural world. We're on this amazing beach. We seem to be the only family on it. You know, maybe that's the fiction of my imagination. But the sky is blue. The water is twinkling with diamonds as the sun is, you know, shining on it. And this incredible sense of homecoming of what was inside of me, because actually our interior space is as vast as the cosmos. You know, that's the reality. Just don't go there when you've got a hangover because it's not a good place to be. It's always better to, to <laughs> externalize at that point. But, uh, but, but the but the that incredible sense of homecoming. The only word that I could describe was beauty, and that's how I ended up writing about beauty as something I thought as absolutely something fundamental to me. And so, the way that I approached the writing of that book, I mean, I talk about it now because I can rationalize it. Mm -hmm. I think when I wrote it, there was no rationalization. It was just, I just need to come home and I need to find, I just need to write about all the things that are really important to me. But essentially, I was writing about what does it mean to be someone that exists in this world, to ask questions, to be creative, to be a maker. What does it mean to come home to, I mean, when we had the other house that we lived in, we had very little light around us. So I could go stand out in our two acre garden and I could just see the stars, you know, in all their glory, smoking a cigarette and, you know, wondering at the majesty of what I was, I was looking at. And, you know, and every night you would go out, the whole, you know, canvas has shifted because obviously, you know, the earth is moving, you know, and everything else, which I thought was actually a pretty amazing. So that reconnection to who we are within this incredible cosmos that we've got, the reconnection to our responsibility of curators and stewards of the world that we we live in, whether that's, you know, a society, a community, the economics, planetary health, you know, whatever. And I thought, how can you do that in a way that would be really easy for someone to understand mm. and comprehend without write, writing 900 pages of something to try and make it a little bit more poetic in the way that you would describe it? And so that's that's that was what I I attempted to do. I've written a number of books before that. You know, one was you know we were up at one hundred eighty thousand words, and you know we got it down to ninety, oh. which is still out there somewhere. I think you know, <laughs> um, waiting to come but, home. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. It did its job, but I think it, if if I'd not written that book, I wouldn't have thought about what is a really different way to engage people with some really fundamental ideas mm -hmm. maybe on on paper would look very disparate and very strange and unusual you know companions together but actually it's it is about trying to find the harmony or a reconnection between those things which is actually what makes us as amazing human beings on this on this planet you know and i think that in my journey, in my lifetime, in my experience of all the things that I've done, all of those things need to be reconnected together. And I, I thought very deeply about teaching, mm -hmm. which was we need to be able to find a way. It's much, it's really easy to, to slice things up into very simple yeah. slices, right? Yeah. So we're going to yeah. learn about this, we're going to learn about that, and it's like, but actually what we're not doing is we're not creating the connectivity or the interrelationship between actually how these things work. Mm -hmm. And to me, that story about beauty and the way of 
introducing people to it and where they could go with it, which is multifaceted in, in many respects. Mm -hmm. But it's very important that people feel that sense of that connectivity and that communication and that interrelationship, which I think very few do in this in this world. Mm -hmm. And and so that's that's kind of partly sort of, you know, the work that we do or the writing around beauty is has has come about that it's so important to, you know, what it is that we're doing. Yeah. And and you said, of course, that this came from a, a time, you know, when you were broken and you're starting to think about all of these things, like what do I need? What are the things that are important to me? It kind of mm -hmm. co coalesces into this simple, not simple, but refined and elegant thing about beauty right and and i think people i think people appreciate beauty but i don't know if a lot of people think that beauty is a necessity and so like what when you <laughs> share these ideas with other people what are some of the biggest either misconcept not misconceptions could be misconceptions or like what ways are you hoping to transform a lot of people when it comes to thinking about beauty I think that um, it's been quite funny, actually, on this journey in that there's really been hostility to what it is that I'm going to do. I mean, there was one time I, I, did, a, I did an event for a very big company in Portugal, mm -hmm. and we had an event at dinner the night before. And this gentleman comes up to me and he says, I hear you're going to be running the day with us tomorrow. So what's it all going to be about? And I said, well, it's going to be about how we're going to make your business more beautiful. And you could see by the look on his face, he, was, he wasn't particularly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't particularly impressed by, by, by this concept. But, you know, in terms of my life, you know, by German, you say my Lebenslaufen. So, you know, my life's run. You know, I've been in a lot of places and I'm pretty, I'm pretty okay with all of it. And in a sense, he kind of inspired me to even kind of be better than I thought, you know, maybe we could do. Anyway, so I did this day for their 70 divisional heads of the this global company. And at the end of it, we finished up. I was sitting down in the in the in the restaurant and I was having some food and this guy came up to me and he said, you know, can I sit with you? And I said, please be my guest. And he said, well, I'd like to apologize. And I said, well, what for? He said, well, to be honest, I really didn't believe that actually you could really help us with the business of what we is we're doing. But he said, I have to say that you've really changed the way that I think about myself and the work that we do. And for that, I want to thank you. And I said, well, you're welcome. And I think that there's just there's just a way where you, as I said, you can maybe it's what I sometimes call a noble conspiracy where you conspire against those you love the most <laughs> when they don't want to choose to believe what it is you're doing. And actually the work is... I think the work is to really speak to the soul of every single person that you're working with. You don't talk about that. That's not that's not what you 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 say you're going to do. But that's where you you kind of go to. Because if you can't shift hearts, you can't shift minds and perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to be a heart shift. Yeah. And so you, you know, I've learned that not everyone wants to sit in a woo-woo circle and, you know, feel, you know, the love of brother man and all the rest of it. You know, we've got all sorts of things going on and I, I don't mean to be trite, but this is a conspiracy in that sense because you can bring all sorts of other things in. If you can open up people's perceptions of themselves yeah. and their possibilities and the potential of what they can be, then you can turn them or help them evolve into agents of change, which is something really different. 
And to me, that is something fundamentally different to saying we're going to be working on, you know, SDGs 1, 7 and 9 or, you know, whatever it's like. Mm. No, we're, we're going to be working on how we get you to think about your business and yourself and the work that you do to be more beautiful and what you can lay out in a, in, in a simple way the story of actually how all of that interconnects into everything that is absolutely relevant to the way that we lead our days, you know, on a, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you know, how we think about legacy, mm-hmm. how we think about how we design stuff, how we then get into where do we take the materials that we make products with, how do we manufacture them, how do we deal with waste, you know, what are the economics that kind of relate to that? So it's a kind of scalable kind of concept. And in actually do build, you know, we have in the back of the book an appendix of 50 businesses I thought were beautiful. Of course, no one ever, ever gets to 100%. It's not like that, but it's like the intention is there. You know, we have a one man, you know, a ceramicist a guy called... Florian Gadsby, who produces, as far as I'm concerned, some of the most sublime ceramics. But it relates to the idea that, you know, William Morris said, have nothing in your house you believe to be neither useful nor beautiful. Hmm. And then we also have a country, which is actually New Zealand, because they have a policy around well-being. And if you have a policy around well-being, then you have a KPI and you have expenditure and you have attention to actually what are the things we need to do if we're going to make the entire population of New Zealand feel better, you know, about themselves. You know, we don't have in England a KPI around well-being, right? And I think so that that discussion then about scale is also very, is, is, is critical. So what depresses me when I see certain events going on, which is, This event is all about, you know, the unicorns, the scalers, the business, the kind of whatever. But actually then all I know is, is that's like, how much money can we make? Mm -hmm. How fast can we make it? And how fast can we exit as a consequence of that? But they're actually not really asking the question, which is actually, does it matter to the world, the work that we are doing? Are we transformative? Are we regenerative? You know, are we actually giving back something that is going to create legacy for the work we do? Because the principal MO for the vast majority of organizations and businesses is is the complete opposite, as I said. How much, how fast, how quick, and can we exit that? That's what we've been taught at school, when you go, when you do an MBA, when you go, you know, this, this, when you, a successful business or a successful person grows forever, apparently, right? And, and it makes no sense if you think about it, but this is what you are. And also, so organizations, cultures, these systems, they reward that behavior. And if you are trying to kind of create some kind of intervention or you want to, you know, have people behave differently, you're going to be punished for it. So I work with a lot of companies where I feel that people are very anxious, very scared, even though they know, you know, they'll know you're right. They'll know you, you know, they, they won't disagree with you, but they don't know how. They don't know how to change. And sure, the the unicorns and the, the, the startups and, and you know, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating kind of bubble in a way, but you know, the larger companies, this, the, the, the global systems that they work in, I find that a lot of these people are, there's a, there's a culture of fear, right? There's a culture of fear of making the wrong mistake, doing things wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't be creative because, you know, creativity means trying things, doing something different, uh, making mistakes, and they can't. And so they don't know any better, or, and even though they might agree with you, they they would they just simply don't know how to do it so where do we hmm. start helping them and i and i think 
I mean, one of the things, and I think that's what you're you're talking about as well, is that you give them a different option. You sh you show them another path, and and a different language, which I think is important because words make things kind of real. Yep. Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a reality. It's language, and in a way, if you show them a different and a path and a different language, and they and you give them that sense of oh, I can yeah, I can do this. This is okay, and it actually you know feels okay. And, it, and you take these slow steps because I think scale also means that you start small and then then you scale, you try. And, but how do we, how do you feel that, or what is your experience in, in really helping people take that first step? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that we, we, so for me, it is a, it is a journey of, it's a learning journey of evolution um, mm -hmm. is the way that I would describe it we run a number of programs for people and we we kind of see it in two ways it's like one is the reset and the other one is the doing so i'm still a you know my i still have a mindset of a designer but you know i have you know my heart is based in the concept of philosophically thinking about you know i suppose i think when i go back to I could have gone to Johnny Johnson's house where he told the story about Auschwitz and kind of really just not been interested remotely about what it was, but it intrigued me, you know. So I have a huge, you know, I really was fascinated by that. So I think you're absolutely right in that we have to give people a different way of looking at the world that feels sensible, realistic, relatable, one that they can embrace maybe not without a little bit of trepidation but nonetheless it's something that that really feels relatable to them and honest and authentic and and to your point the language thing i'm i'm really obsessed by it having albeit you know i mean my life started off as a visual designer mm. and but communication has always been a sort of a very core cool part of my 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 life the the idea of how you write there are people that write out there that have very very important things to say but they wrap it up in so much complexity and verbose language and very long paragraphs and sentences and all the rest of it that kind of people just kind of go i give up because uh, you know you're far more you're far more intelligent than i am so and i'm the, i'm the i'm i'm the complete opposite which is look, I really want to get this information to you mm -hmm. and I want you to hold this information or this idea, this possibility, this mindset, this process, and you can own it. You can be the owner of those things. It's not about me at all. And with that language, then you can start to speak to other people. And I know that when I left the industries that I was, you know, I'd built my career on, you know, a number of years ago, it was a really weird place to be because what language do I use? Who do I trust? And I kind of really empathize with, with that. You know, it's a bit like leaving a marriage, you know, we've mm -hmm. been, you know, we've been together for 24 years, you know, we're now splitting up. I never really thought about, you know, having a relationship. I want to be in a relationship. How do I do those things? So I think that really helping people with that journey, even out of a practice of inquiry and curiosity with a little bit of structure in it. So we take people from the question of what is beauty with quite a lot of input in terms of helping them sort of think about that to the idea that were you to design a business that was more beautiful, what would that look like? At the end of it, what I'm hoping is, is that the, the individual has gone on their own personal journey of transformation. They're thinking about their team, if they have one, that would go on a journey of transformation. They're thinking now about business, not as sustainable, but as a regenerative and feel that actually they've got some courage and some knowledge 
to help them map that out in terms of what that might what that might look like i i also think that you are a great storyteller so i think the way you communicate is through stories and relatable stories right so i will never forget that story of you sitting in your room imagining dead yeah. bodies piling up <laughs> right no but i won't I, yeah. I i won't i will never forget those stories because that's such a wonderful gift if you can share and communicate and share wisdom and ideas and uh, philosophies through stories i think that's also really power the power of language really if it's you know if it's kind of you know in use for storytelling it's very powerful yeah yeah and if i may say that i mean the reality is is that we are you know we are metaphysical anim animals you know as a, as a species so the storytelling is you know, no one comes into a pub on a Friday night, gets their laptop out, and gives you a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> of their week. Would be very funny though. Not any they of would, my friends. They, they would. They would say, "You'd never guess what's happened to me today," or you know, "You never guess what's happened to this week." So it's all about mm -hmm. storytelling. Exactly. And we can we can use that. You know, some people kind of like roll their eyes and go, "You know, yeah, blah blah blah," but it's absolutely true. And it's the threads that construct worlds in terms of how we see things. And I said, you know, the story, the story then is the narrative frame. And what is held in a narrative frame is what people see. So if we think about mm. what's happening, say, in the United States at the moment, you know, with the presidential election, two very different stories of the potential of what the USA might look like. And I think that that is very, very important to people to really understand and to see. And personally, for me, I think that, you know, Mr. T is telling a lot of porky pies, as we were saying in English. <laughs> Whoppers. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. yeah. <laughs> fragment for lies. <laughs> and, but people want to believe mm -hmm. that this idea of, and, and of course it's, you know, it's multi-layered. There's a lot of people that feel that they've been left behind. You know, the American dream is not the dream. There is not social mobility. It's a stagnated, uh, you know, economy in many places where people are very stuck, you mm -hmm. know, through the demise of some of their great, you know, economic engines are making steel manufacture, you know, whatever. A lot of things have been out offshored. And these people hurt. And of course they hurt. And I and I feel for them, you know, because if you wake up every morning, you know, with a knot in your gut about how do I pay the rent, how do I pay, you know, the electricity, whatever, and someone's coming along and they're telling you that they're gonna make America great again. And, you know, they that he's you know, he's touching on all of the tropes of narrative which are making these people you know, feel the way that they do. And it's the same in all sorts of other, you know, yeah. places around the world, you know, so it's not just in one place, but there's many, and we have it in England as well. You know, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. It's very easy to point the, the, you know, the finger. If you're a victim, you need to find you know, someone that's doing bad things to you. And, you know, immigration seems to be the popular topic of choice at this at this moment in time and so the skillful orator writer narrator if they can change that 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 conversation and get other things into that frame of what hope means and what optimism means what the potential is you know i mean the idea is is that i can't remember so i'm just going to grab this out of the air but I mean, I think that there are trillions of dollars that could be made by turning us into a real green economy. You know, so the folks that were down the mines, the folks that were in, you know, extractive economies in one form or another, you know, industries, we're turning, we're, we're now creating, you know, industries which are regenerative, you know, whether that, obviously that would be through energy, particularly, or when we were thinking about, cars or aviation or you know thinking really differently about an economy in a way which is really regenerative 
actually could be supplying a whole set of jobs. And this conversation has come up and come down over, you know, many years, but like in, let's say, you know, the beginning of our century, if you said that there would be people that would be working in what we call IT and tech Mm -hmm. and silicon chip manufacturer or, you know, whatever, those jobs didn't exist. There was no money for those things. Mm -hmm. So to me, then it's about shaping the narrative of the conversation of where actually we think that our society or our economies could be were we to really look about them, thinking about them as being truly beautiful, go truly regenerative and actually creating something very different for a future that we could look at that we would we would feel very optimistic about. I mean, I was born in 1964. Obviously, I don't remember much about the 60s because, you know, I was a kid. So the 70s was kind of more my my time. But, you know, when you go back and you look at the music of the 60s mm-hmm. globally, from a Western perspective anyway, or, you know, you look at documentaries made about the time. If you look about, you know, what was being done in terms of, infrastructure house building you know whatever there was this incredible sense of optimism Mm. you know it was almost like within the dna and we live in a moment which is very dystopian i feel it feels very i never thought at my age i would look at a world that would feel as dark and as dangerous as the one we've got yeah that's that's that said i think that there are, you know, the generation below us or below me anyway, they are steeped in values. You know, they know that maybe they'll never own a house. They won't have a job for life. They won't have a pension. But actually, they really think about the planet and they really think about a world that they could make better than the one that they currently have, you know. And I think that that is a I know from through the work that we've been doing, that's a global force of people that you won't see on the front pages again or the back pages of any right-wing press because they want to hold a particular type of narrative. But these people want a different, want want a better world. And even if you think about migration in that sense, these folks, these folks risk everything because they believe that actually they might be safe, uh, and they might be able to contribute to something of, you know, a, a, a better life than the one that they they would have if they'd stayed behind, you know. And that's how I feel about that. So I I, my, I have I have I've had two kids, and my my son is uh, is still twelve years old. And uh, every day we watch. Uh, so in the Netherlands we have this kids news. Mm-hmm. So it's we watch, uh, learning Dutch as well, which is what I watch oh, sometimes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. And and anyway, so basically they do cover all the world events, really. And every day there there's a there's you know an item about a flood somewhere. There's a flood and there's war. There's a war, obviously, there's a couple of wars going on. There's war and floods. And you know, every every day. And and so if I think about the way I grew up, I mean, I'm I'm from 68. So I actually also kind of the 70s and specifically also the uh, the 80s were my, you know, know, my childhood. But I I remember growing up in a time where we had the Soviet Union as a threat, sort of like, you know, the bomb. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, yeah. Was the, that was the, the thing. And then I also remember the wall coming down. Mm. Very, I mean, there was, I mean, that was, I was, what was I, 20 something. and. But this idea that things would slowly get ba- better, right? Mm. Everything would get better, slowly get better. And then I see my kid watching that news with the floods and the war and the things and 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 Putin and, you know, and and I think, oh, it's not a given. We really have to work at it. It's not something we can just say like, oh, no, you know, that's evolution. Evolution makes, you know, that means that everything slowly gets better for us as people. It's not. We have to design the future. We have to create it, and and I I'm I'm kind of positive when I when I think about the, the at least my my kids and I and mm-hmm. the, and their friends and because they're really aware of this this something's happening. 
I think what you said is very important. And this idea that we can design the future, you know, I'd say that everything man made in this world is designed. Mm. At one point, it doesn't exist. We sit there and we kind of go, wouldn't it be nice if we had some heat around here? So it kind of goes, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we need, maybe we need to make some fire. You know, it's like, you know, that's obviously, I don't know, there's a bush burning over there or, you know, what, but yeah. what if we were really able to, you know, like, so, so I, I think that, you know, we are, we are extraordinary on that level in terms of our tool making and designing the future on I think is, is absolutely right. And, and I think that, you know, giving people that potential of the possibility that you can make a difference, mm-hmm. which we were talking much earlier in the conversation, I think is so important. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had, so we have a newsletter called Living Beautifully. And, you know, I we, we used to put it out once a month. It's a little bit more sporadic than that these days. But, you know, I like to sit down and I talk about beautiful, beautiful conversations, beautifully made, beautifully built, restorative food, insights, books, leadership, whatever. I'm trying to show through this this curation of this information that actually there are some amazing things going on. And and some of them is like, you know, there's there's a particular film I, I found, which was a company... It was based in the States. I can't remember where it was, whether it was in Los Angeles or somewhere else. But they hand roll C- Cuban cigars, right? So smoking's really bad for you, right? Shouldn't smoke. But this this film was so fantastic in terms of the community that they built around guys being able to come together and have a smoke and have a conversation. And it, it kind of really built something. And to me, that's like, that's also something very, very beautiful. As well as, you know, you could say someone working on a very regenerative manufacturing enterprise where, you know, they're taking fishing nets out of the sea, you know, they're paying indigenous communities to do that. That gives them money, which they would never normally had, you know, whatever. And and so that idea of sharing the concept of beauty is, is something which is, you know, vast and wonderful is, is one I'm really keen to share with people to say that, you know, there are so many. So in a way, it's just like a form of inspiration of we can dream to design the world better than the one we currently have, you know, and it doesn't have to exist in this one place. And art plays a very big part role in my life. And so we need to have artists, you know, Mm. talking about, you know, the world that we're, we're in the world that we're living in. How do we critique that? What do we talk about? I'm really keen about that. Architecture to me is very important. I was born in Letcher's Garden City, which was the first garden city in the world. I had the first roundabout in the world. And again, you know, maybe not many people would have been born in Letchworth and really thought about its heritage and all the rest of it, but <laughs> I did. And and so I think a lot about urban environments and the quality of life that maybe people would have if you, you know, just design things in a way where it's a good place for people to want to be in and live in and, you know, move about in and, and all the rest of it. That should be beautiful, which means then there's a quality of life and experience that you're you're having in those in those places and spaces. Thank you. I I have a hard time ending this conversation because <laughs> we always uh, do. Because I know, but I love listening to to you and uh, and what you're saying because it's very inspirational. And lots of stuff is going on in my head. Like, yeah, same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is so cool. I think it's a, it's it's a wonderful approach. I think that's very inspirational, the approach of uh, beauty. I like that. So I, I think I'm going to, that's going to be, I'm going to yeah. think about that for and a very I, long time. <laughs> and I love that it's not just, of course, it's not just the aesthetics of something, but it's mm. way more than that. 
And it doesn't only apply to things we design. It can also apply to us and our soul. It can also apply to how we live our life. It's much bigger than just what we design. It's yeah. It's really yeah. Cool. And creative leadership sort of it, our kind of yeah, our search for what that means. Mm -hmm. And and it's gonna create a language around that. I think what you're kind of you're saying and you you as a person basically I think you are the, that kind of creative leader in the sense that to us creative leaders create options that we didn't even know was possible create sort of alternatives and say yeah but you can also talk about it this way or look at it from this angle or hey there's another path and then other people are like oh I didn't even know that was possible or allowed even or you know, you, mm. you have permission to people permission I think permission is a very important word yeah giving people permission so, I think is very very important sorry i use that word too much important but um, <laughs> i think I, I think it very is important. just to give someone that sense that they that is an option for mm. them you know and we are we are prisoners all of us around our own perceptions of right. what we are and what we could become or you know what has happened to us which then kind of relates to these sorts of things. And then you give someone permission to explore the potential of what an alternative perspective might look like. Exactly. And it's, it, it's, you know, it's freedom for, for a lot of people, yes. you know, I always remember when I was, when I was very poorly and I was having therapy and this lady said to me, she said, when do you start work? And I said, well, I start work at eight in the morning. And she said, and when do you stop? And I said, well, about eight at night. And she said, and she said what do you do between eight and eight? And I said, well, I work. That's what I do. That's, uh, you know. And she said, but you live in the countryside, don't you? Which I did. And, and I said, I did. I do. She said, you could go for a walk. It was a bit like Zoe. Do you know when you thought the earth was flat? <laughs> it's actually round. <laughs> and, and and it was it was just it was an extraordinary moment. And we we just acquired a dog. He's no longer with us, sadly, Piper. But so Pipey and I would then go on two to three hour walks during the day. And it was just, you know, the most liberating experience. And you know. I ended up having my best friend for life. And also on these walks, you got to thought, think about the world in a very different type of way, you know? So there was an incredible form of liberation. So sometimes the doors to perception only just need to be opened a little bit, you know, or you just need to shift the axis, the axis of perception in a way where you're really helping people to see the world in a very different type of way and the potential that they've got to play a role in that. And to me, that's then both exciting and very energizing to help people go on that, on that journey. Yes, I can imagine. And I think you're doing uh, an amazing job. So opening the door, uh, one of the doors of perception to us, that was, uh, thank you so much for doing that. And yeah. uh, so thanks for being on the Thank podcast. Um, we, uh, I think we really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's really shifted how I think about beauty. Yeah. Well, lovely to meet you both. I very much enjoyed it. <laughs>